All right, well, if you have a Bible, grab them and open them to James chapter 3. That's where we're going to be tonight, James chapter 3. Uh, one of the interesting things about James is that there's something he mentions in every chapter of this letter, and that is our speech, our tongue, what we say, and the importance of it. He hits on it in every chapter of this book. And so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight, is taming the tongue. James chapter 3. Um, y'all follow along. Let's read the first couple verses. James writes, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole life body. Now, when I, when I think about this passage, I'm reminded just of teachers in general. And I think back on my high school days, and I've told you all this several times, no surprise, I was not a fan of school. I like legit didn't like school. I don't mean I just didn't care for it. I mean like I really despised school from an early age. I begged my parents, what's the point in high school? What's the point? I'm never going to college. That's just not me. I'm going to be a welder. That's what I want to do from the time I was like 13 years old up. I'm a weld. Work in a shop and weld. High school means nothing. And so I want it out. Well, if someone doesn't have any desire for something, it makes it really tough for them to be committed to it and to stick to it and to try, right? Well, that led to all sorts of problems. I've told you I was punished repeatedly for my grades, things like that. But something changed my senior year. That, that really made this a whole nother conversation or thought to have, and that was the 25th of October, my senior year, because I turned 18 years old, and guess what 18-year-olds can do without parental consent? Drop out. You can drop out. You can quit. You can bail out. So two months into my senior year, I thought, I'm done. I'm checking out. Thankfully, Live Oak had a teacher, Miss Trudy, and I actually ran into her a few years ago when my wife had a pending ceremony at Southeastern. I happened to run into her, and I told her, you have no idea the impact that you had on me my senior year because I cared nothing for school, didn't want to come, and this woman would call me out of class and sit me in her office and just say, Brian, let's talk. You, you've made it this far. You can't quit now. Stick with it. You never know how your life may change. You never know the direction the path of your life. You can make it. Let me work with you and see what I can do. She was our guidance counselor. And so Miss Trudy went down and she looked through and she got me enrolled in Louisiana Votec College. And so I, I went to high school my senior year for just one hour. I took English four because you have to have four Englishes to graduate. So I took English four and then I took off and drove all the way to Greensburg. Me and two good friends of mine we did that our senior year and went to welding school. So by the time I graduated high school, not only did I now have a high school diploma, but also had a diploma from a vocational college. And so I went straight to work, and it served me well. And all of that was due to a teacher who took the time to talk to me. Look, even when it got close to the end of my senior year, I had missed so much school. She said, Brian, I have begged and pleaded with the principal of this school. I've done everything I can do, and he is so fed up. He said, if you miss one day, if you even show up late one day, your diploma is gone. You're not going to graduate. He's not going to let you go. And so I can remember thinking, running late a few mornings, thinking, oh, my goodness, Miss Trudy. I was not worried about the high school. I was, not, I was worried about Miss Trudy letting her down. This woman invested in me. And so when I think about the, the importance a teacher can make, probably most of us can think of some kind of teacher, not just at your school, but some figure in life who's made a big impact. Teachers can have that influence on people who follow them. Another lady that I think about is Henrietta Mears. So probably you haven't heard of her. Um, she passed away years ago, but this is a lady that uh, went to Hollywood Presbyterian Church, and she was over the Sunday school kind of curriculum. A lot of Christian, uh, Christian people would call her the, the most influential person in Christian education of the last 100 years. A lot of people would say, hands down, it's not even close the most influential person in Christian education. She started 
her own publishing house. She started all sorts of things, but she was in charge of Sunday school cur- curriculum for children all the way up to adults, and she was in charge of Sunday school program at her church where it was dying and dead. It was just about done with. And so she took off with this, creating this curriculum, really pushing it, and leading and teaching people, working with children, and saw that church go from a Sunday school attendance of 450 to 4,500 in just two years. Some of the people, Bill Bright, who went on to found Campus Crusades for Christ, was one of the kids that she brought up. Another one you probably have heard of, Billy Graham. There were tons of people. There's a whole tree of very influential people. Like Billy Graham, he's probably preached the gospel to millions of people throughout his lifetime. Most people would say he was the most powerful evangelist of the last hundred years, Easily. And they were all people who were discipled by this woman who devoted herself to caring for others. That's the impact one teacher, one person can have. Also think of the negative side of that. There's a guy y'all maybe have heard of, maybe haven't, named John Jones. Um, Jim Jones. Anyways, he, he had a town... He had a, this is back in, I think, 50s, 60s, it, it all ended in 78, but he actually used churches wrongfully to try and draw crowds in and to build a church. He was a part of numerous different denominations, and he met, he saw this guy was a faith healer and thought, man, this guy can draw a big crowd. So he got this faith healer to come in and have a big service and then end up growing a church and building a church and had such a powerful lead over these people that he got them to move to uh, another island and start their own town called uh, John's, called, ugh, what was it? Jonestown. Called Jonestown. And he had about a thousand of his followers that lived there, gave their whole lives to go live in this town. He abused them. He took advantage of them. And they followed him and gave everything to go be part of this cult. Until in 1978, some agents with the United States government were suspicious of what was going on with this cult. And they went down there to check it out, look things out. And just as they're getting on a plane to come back home, his followers gunned them down, killed them. And the next day, probably the largest murder-suicide that ever took place, it was almost 1,000 people including him and his wife and all their followers that had cyanide-poisoned Kool-Aid, essentially, that they drank, and it was a mass suicidal thing that just took out right out a 1,000 people. That's the power that a teacher or leader can have not done right. That's why you may hear that phrase over the last 40 years it's become popular. You hear people say, don't drink the Kool-Aid. That's where that comes from, that story when he took all these people and had them drink that and commit suicide. Leaders can have a massive impact. And for that reason, James tells us, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So what reasons does James give us? Three of them. One is judgment. We'll be judged with greater strictness. So teachers are going to be held to a higher standard. Now, keep in mind, this is not, the purpose in writing this is not to say, um, I don't want you to teach. Like, it's not to dissuade you from teaching, but rather, if you have the gift of teaching, to help you to, to honor it and to do right by it, to not go wayward, not get attracted by the world, but to say, it's good that you have a gift to teach, but you need to make sure you're staying devoted to the right purpose. Don't let the world pull you away. Listen to what Luke 12 says. Luke 12, 48. It says, Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. You see, the greater privilege means the greater responsibility. When you teach, when you lead, you have a big privilege. It should be an honor to teach and lead other people, to, to explain things, to illustrate things. That's a blessing. We shouldn't be dissuaded by this, but rather we should realize the seriousness of it and take God's word seriously. Teachers are going to be judged by a couple different things. One, the content, obviously. If you know you're going to be held to a higher standard, when you stand up and teach, what you teach matters. Content matters. I could stand up here and just simply tell jokes and tell funny stories 
Because you can find that pretty easily in youth ministry, where it's a whole lot of that, and at the very end of a sermon, you just throw a verse in, and like, oh yeah, I got this, uh, kind of read this verse. And that's, that's the point. No, our content matters. We should be digging into God's Word. What does God's Word say? Give me some illustrations of this lived out. Show me how this applies to my life. Let's stay devoted to God's Word. The content of our teaching matters. We must guard our doctrine, but not just the content. The character of the teacher also matters. So not just is it important that I teach truth, it's important that I live out the truth that I'm teaching. If you hear me saying one thing up here, and then you're like, yeah, but Mr. Brown, I see you in the evenings and on the weekends, and you're not living by what you're saying. There, there's an obvious disconnect. That's going to give you reason to doubt what I'm saying, right? Content matters and character matters. As teachers, we're going to be held to a higher standard. If you aspire to teach, watch your doctrine and watch your character. Some teachers start off maybe good and then get lured away. They get enticed by the world. I want to read a passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now follow along. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. The apostle Paul writes, he says, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Did y'all catch all that? If you didn't, here's the point. Let me boil that down into really simple language, because sometimes that thing, you will be saved, but only as through fire. Sometimes that throws people off. You've got a few different elements, wood, hay, and stubble. What do those things do in a fire? They burn and they're gone. They're done. That would be poor things, bad things. But then you also have the good things, gold, silver, and precious stones. Those don't just burn up in a fire. Those are desired items. So if, if you go back and read through what Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, He's saying we all build upon the foundation that is Christ. So Christ is that foundation. And so if you're the teacher, you come along, he's saying, now if anyone builds on that foundation, which is Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, good, noble things, as in sound doctrine, biblical truth, you build on that with your ministry, that's good. But even if you're saved, I'm not talking about someone who's not a believer, someone who's a believer, let's say, I'm a believer, truly am saved, but I don't take my job of teacher very seriously. And while Christ is the cornerstone to what I'm building on, all I'm doing is coming up here trying to entertain you, make you laugh, be ultra trendy, have lots of cool jokes. That's all I'm concerned with. I'm concerned with how many likes can I get on social media, those types of things. If that's the point, you're building on top of that foundation is Christ with wood, hay, and stubble. Those things are no good. They have no eternal reward. They're going to be burned up on that final day when you stand before God and give an account for your life. You'll be left with that foundation that's Christ, but it's kind of like, man, you use some junk to build on your ministry. When you aspire to teach, you're going to be held to a higher standard. So it's important that we realize we should build upon that on that cornerstone with gold, silver, and with precious stones. Why? Because you will be rewarded one day. Look, our salvation is secure. Look at Romans 8.1. Paul's writings. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That verse rings true. If you're a teacher, even if you built with wood, hay, and stubble, there's no condemnation. You're not losing your salvation because you taught the wrong way or you didn't take it quite seriously enough. But something we kind of avoid in Baptist life is talking about rewards. Your works don't gain you salvation, but you absolutely are going to be rewarded for a faithful life of serving the Lord. Look at Romans 14, 12. He says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Paul's saying each and every one of us. Yes, there's no condemnation for you. The Romans 8 is true. But you're still going to have to stand before God and give an account for your life. Every one of us. 
You're going to have to say, hey, I taught, I preached and led Bible studies for Thrive Student Ministries for X amount of years, and I'm going to have to explain to God, what did I preach to y'all? What did I teach? Did I take it seriously? Was I really devoted to it? Did I really try and help you understand this? Or was I just full of jokes and cokes and didn't care? And in 2 Corinthians 5.10, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Think about that. We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, every one of us. Yes, Romans 8, no condemnation for us. You're still going to stand before him, give account for your life, Romans 14 and 2 Corinthians. You're all going to appear before that judgment seat of Christ. But notice what he says in the middle of that, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body. You're going to receive what is due for what you've done in this time. When you stand there, is God going to say, you're saved, you placed your faith in me, that is awesome. Enter to your eternal reward. But there's nothing else after that. You didn't do, there's no crowns to be given to you to cast back at the feet of Christ once you get to heaven. You didn't build anything up. You built with wood, hay, and stubble. It all burn up. You're saved, and it's a glorious thing. Don't get me wrong. This can be a tricky thing to discuss because I don't want you to think heaven's going to be kind of like, eh, kind of dull because I didn't do a whole lot. We're going to be praising God. It's going to be awesome. But you are absolutely rewarded for a life of faithful service to the Lord. And so we should all strive to earn these eternal rewards for living a godly life. Secondly, he says that we're all sinners. He says there at the beginning of James 3 that we all stumble in many ways. And we know that. There's no perfect teacher out there who never sins. James makes it clear that all of us stumble. All of us do. Right? We get that. For all of sin to fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Whether you're a youth pastor, senior pastor, senior adult leader, or a teenager. That's all of us. However, if you aspire to be a teacher, Scripture is pretty clear, you must live a life that is not of, where you're, you don't have a known reputation of a life that's devoted to this sinful lifestyle. You should be above reproach. We should not have this well-known reputation for stumbling continuously. You're the one, remember we said earlier, your, your character matters just like the content of your teaching matters. We must not be ones. Yes, we sin, but we must not live a life that is marked by constant stumbling. And lastly, he mentions the tongue, our speech. Notice what he said. We who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble. And he says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. And so teachers must have control over their tongues. Now, this is an important trait for a teacher, someone who has influence over others, because that's how teachers make that influential impact on others, right? Through teaching. Maybe it's through writing their words down or typing their words out or orally communicating their words, but our words matter. Our words matter. That's how you teach and spread things. And so teachers of all, of all people, it is vital that we watch that. But James moves on to talk further, not just to teachers, but every Christian as well, and really harp on the importance of our language. So y'all look at verse 3. Verse 3. James writes, he says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. The tongue is powerful. He uses horses as an illustration at the beginning. So probably, well, most of you have ridden horses. This past summer, we all went horseback riding at camp, if you were there. So you think of a horse, most horses weigh a little under 1,000 pounds. Some of them up to 1,000 or just over 1,000 pounds. But in that neighborhood... A lot of horses are going to be 800 pounds, roughly. And yet, we can get on the back of that horse with a saddle and everything, and that horse can take off across the pasture, running fast, running for a long ways. You get a team of horses, put them together, and they can pull wagons loaded down with stuff. You get some big draft horses. 
You know what I'm talking about? Like the Budweiser horses, that's what they call draft horse. You get some of those kind of horses, a big Belgian or something like that. You get some of those and they can pull insane amounts of weight. They are powerful, strong animals. And that big, strong animal, all it takes is that one little metal bit that fits under their tongue and you can control that whole animal. We even rate engines with horsepower. How many horsepower is it? But all of that can be controlled by that one little bit under the tongue. You pull it this way and the horse goes left. You pull it right, it goes right. You pull back and it stops. You pull back and kick and they back up. You direct them all over the place with that one little bit under their tongue. He talks about ships too. Ships being driven by the wind. I think of, uh, we've been to the USS Kid several times. I got to spend the night on it when I was a kid. No pun intended. Um, I've been to the USS Alabama a few times. Anybody ever been there? Surely some of y'all have stopped by there. Yes. So that's always one of those places I have to be careful. I don't bump my head going in because if you ever notice USS Alabama, all those little destroyers and battleships, they, they got tiny little door openings. You got to squat down and squeeze in them. But I've toured that ship a few different times and I'm always fascinated by it. I love looking at those ships. They've been out of commission for decades. But it's fascinating to walk around and look at what the military has and these ships that just seem gigantic. The Alabama's just under 700 feet long, chunk of metal with guns and cannons all over the place, cafeterias, barbershops, sleeping quarters. It's got all of this stuff on this big ship. When it's loaded down, ready for war, they put about 2,500 people on that ship. All sorts of ammunition and bombs and bullets, all this stuff, fuel. It goes all the way across the oceans. You know how much it weighs, ready for wartime? 90 million pounds. Think about that. 90 million pounds. That's a lot of weight. And that entire hunk of iron, that big ship that's going out there, is directed and controlled by that one rudder in the back of it. That one little flap, essentially, that turns this way and this way to direct the ship into which way it goes through the ocean, to guide it. That's all it takes. James is saying, your tongue is that powerful. It's the same way. That one little tongue in your mouth can direct your entire body, the direction you go, how people view you. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Listen to what he says in verses 5 through 8. He says, How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. The tongue is not only powerful, but it's destructive. You hear, as he talks about how it's destructive, he talks about a fire. Now y'all know I love my mountains especially Smoky Mountains, I refer to them all the time. Um, But back in 2016, while that was our year to have the flood, something devastating happened to Smoky Mountain National Park. Fires broke out, and it burned up about 6,000 acres, buildings, property, outside the park, and about 10,000 acres inside the park. You're talking about a national park that's got some cabins that are 150 that's a 200 years old. You don't just remake that. That's history. It can be lost with the fire. The whole chimney trail area of the park burn up, set ablaze. It was a severe drought. 14 people lost their lives. It was devastating to Gatlinburg and to Pigeon Forge, the businesses that were, that were just completely destroyed throughout this fire. It had a massive impact on this park. And all of that started from two careless teenagers that around Thanksgiving Day had a fire that left intentionally unattended and the winds took off. And next thing you know, we are months later still trying to put this massive fire out after billions of dollars worth of damage has taken place. James says, your tongue is the same way. That's the seriousness of what your speech can do and why it matters. You think about some of the animals. He mentions animals that have been tamed. People can tame a tiger, a lion. 
You've seen these shows, people have pet grizzly bears, for crying out loud, that they bury fish and let their pet grizzly bear go dig it up and find it. All of these things, women who will, in these other countries, get these cobras and kiss them and all that. And I know sometimes they sew their mouth shut and all. But we tame all sorts of crazy animals. I've seen people with pet alligators that lay in a bed with them. You can find all kind of goofy stuff that people will tame, animals that you would never think could be tamed. I remember seeing a show with hyenas, an animal that they say can't be tamed, but God had several of them that were like a dog for them, pets in Florida. But yet, out of all those things, he says, the one thing you cannot tame is your tongue. We can't tame our tongue. So how can this tongue be so powerful and also so destructive? I want to mention a few things before we close, ways that I think our tongues can get us into trouble. One, gossip. We know what gossip is. And let's be honest. At some point, we have all taken part in gossip. No one's free of this. I would guarantee you, with a few minutes of talking, we can think of a time that you all took part in gossiping about someone else. That's when you say something behind somebody's back that you would never say to their face. You say something, you degrade someone, you talk about them, you don't like them. Whatever the case may be, we do this. We're tempted to do this. And we do this, and stop and think about it this way. We do this knowing that what I'm saying is about someone else who's created in God's image. God created them in their mother's womb. God planned for that person to come, yet I think I have the right to tear them down and say something behind their back about them. Even in Christian circles, we have our own unique way of getting away with gossip. Right? How many times somebody say, Hey, we need to pray for so-and-so. Did you hear what happened with them? Here's why we need to pray for them. Okay, well, if you want to pray for them, go pray for them and shut your mouth. You don't have to come tell the whole youth group why we need to pray for so-and-so. Just go pray for them if you truly want to. We like to try and disguise it. Or people say, hey, I'm just going to tell you all this because I know we're all brothers and sisters in Christ and I know you want what's best for them. You need to know what's happening. Well, no, no, you really don't. You don't have to disclose all these details. We shouldn't be the ones that are in the business of going behind each other's backs and talking and saying things. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are united in Christ. We should be honest and upfront with people and encourage them. Go to God with your thoughts and concerns. Avoid gossip. Another way we can, our speech, our tongues can get us in trouble is innuendo. If y'all know what I mean, when you insinuate something. So not just as saying something wrong, but sometimes not saying something can be wrong as well. Or how you say something. If you insinuate something with your speech, sometimes it's the way you say something that can intentionally put doubt in someone else's mind where you're misleading them. Th think of it this way. So there was a story um, that I'd read about a, a, a sailor who had, had too much to drink and came in late. So the captain of the ship wrote him up, and on the board he put, so-and-so showed up drunk. So they docked him. Had him kind of a mark for that day. Had too much to drink, I think he put. Had too much to drink, showed up late. So this guy's kind of like, okay. So a little while later, he wrote on the board, captain showed up to the ship today, and he was sober. Well, yeah, he was sober. He hadn't been drinking. But he didn't have a problem drinking. But the way you word that, what you said is true, but the way you say it, you're misleading people. You're intentionally trying to insinuate something. Look, it'd be the same thing as in, in my situation with y'all. If I go get on to your parents, I call, let's say I call your parents, I'm like, man, so-and-so was gossiping. They shouldn't be doing that. I don't want that in this youth group. We need to learn not to do that. And you get mad at me, and so the next week you go home and you're like, hey, your parents says, how was Bible study? Oh, it was good. Mr. Brian led a Bible study, and he didn't curse us. Okay, so what are you insinuating? That I do that normally? Like, are you trying to say that I normally? No, you're intentionally misleading. Sometimes our words, how we say things, and maybe what we don't say, what we insinuate, can be just as deceitful and as wrong as what we do say. Don't gossip. Don't partake in innuendo. Don't insinuate things. Even flattery. I know we use that phrase actually in a positive way sometimes. Oh, I'm flattered. 
I'm flattered that you would say this. It's a very negative phrase, though. It's very negative. Flattery is extremely negative. Scripture, if you do a word study, is replete with verses, putting down on flattery and how God hates flattering lips. It's not good. What flattery actually is, is the exact opposite. I've told you this before. It's the exact opposite of gossip. Gossip is saying something behind somebody's back that you would never say to their face. Flattery is saying something to somebody's face that you would never say behind their back. So flattery is saying, oh man, you just look fantastic tonight. You really look good. And then as soon as they turn their back, they look terrible. They look hideous. That is gross. That's nasty. I can't stand to look at them. When you really despise someone, but yet to make yourself look good, to make them feel good, you say something good to their face. Gossip is saying something behind somebody's back you'd never say to their face. Flattery is saying something to somebody's face that you would never say behind their back because you really don't care for them at all. We should not participate in flattery. And lastly, criticism. We're overly critical with others. We critique them in a cruel way, not constructive criticism, not, I want you to be better, like here, I think you could tweak this. But we love to point out others' flaws. We love to look at other people and say, you're terrible at this, I don't like this, you don't do this. To, to critique them in a harsh way. Look how James ends it. He picks up in verse 9. He says, after talking about our tongues and the ways we sin, he says, with it, speaking of our tongues, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening? both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. James is saying, with your mouth, that you're blessing God, praising God over here, you're going to use that same tongue to then run someone in dirt or curse them or talk bad about them, gossip about them, use flattery negatively about them. We just sing songs where we talk about praising the name of God, that he has the name above all names. We're going to praise him for that and bless him and sing and then turn around and use that same mouth and that same tongue to run someone in the dirt. How could we possibly do this? So James is trying to show us the seriousness of our tongues. Look at Matthew 12, 36 and 37. Matthew Wright says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Your words matter. And in Luke 6, 45, he says, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Look, I'll wrap up with uh, going back over something that happened years ago. So, as in teenager, I always tend to go back to teenage years. I guess because I was dumb enough, made enough poor decisions. I've got lots of illustrations of things. But I did something that no guy should ever do. So, guys, listen to this. Don't take this advice. I was dating a girl. I liked her. And so I decided... One day, I liked her so much, and, I, and I'd, I'd gotten to know the family, so I would go over there even when she wasn't there sometimes, just hang out at their house. I had siblings, and I knew all them. So I'm over there one day when she's not there, hadn't been dating very long, and I decided to go in her bedroom to dig through it, to find her journal, and to read her journal. Now, in today's context, that would probably be the equivalent of knowing someone's passcode on their phone and getting in it and digging through all their texts or something. Maybe y'all still put pen to paper and write journals, but that's what I did. I went in there and I took that journal and I read through it. Well, I felt bad about it. And so I went back and ended up telling her later. And it was a big stink, trust me. There was a big stink because trust was broken, absolutely broken. Because this girl had poured her heart out in this journal. And here I am invading her privacy and taking it and reading it because I wanted to know. I read it. And it caused a big stink. Now, luckily, 
She got over it because we've been married now for 17 years. We've been together for a little over 20 years. So she got over it. And as a matter of fact, when I told her last night, hey, I'm going to use that as an illustration tomorrow, she said, wait, you read my journal? She had forgotten. And she's like, now I'm mad. And I said, no, you can't get mad now. That's 22 years ago. It doesn't matter. You didn't even remember I did it. She's like, but you read my journal. You can't read my journal. That's my fault. That's my journal. And I'm like, you didn't even remember it. But I did it. But look, all that's funny. What was the point? What's the point? Because her words, the things she spoke and wrote, her words when no one else is around, that revealed what was in her heart. And I wanted to know how she truly felt. I was dying to know what was on the inside. And I knew it would come out of her mouth through her writing and what she put. And so I wanted to know what she felt. That's why I went for those words. Our words matter. They matter. They mattered enough that I would sneak in a room and read her journal. They matter for you. Remember, you can't unsay something. Once you say it, it's said. It's there. Our words matter. We should rather use our words to glorify God. Look at this last passage in Romans 10. Apostle Paul, once again, he writes in Romans 10, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Look, the gospel that Jesus sent his son and died for us, and that if we repent of our sins and trust in him, you will be saved. That's the message we are to take to every creature on the planet. That only happens through words. It requires the tongue. It requires you to speak and tell people the gospel. We've seen James illustrate the importance of our words. How the way we live them out and what we say matters. Content and character. Let's use our lives to display the gospel and actually orally speak the gospel to people. So that we can be the ones, like in Romans 10, 15, where it says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That all of us would have beautiful feet. As Paul says, as we live lives that are marked with Christian character and Christian content that comes out of our mouth as we strive to further the kingdom of God. Let's pray, and we'll be closed.